welcome to Becoming Parents Podcast. I'm your host, Jennifer Campbell. I'm a doula in Washoe County, Nevada, a Medicaid provider, a lactation educator, childbirth educator, and mom of 18. You can find me and connect on doulainreno.com. Remember, give a shout out to those who are brave enough to share their stories with us on how they have become parents. Let's dive in. Welcome to Becoming Parents Podcast. I'm the host, Jennifer Campbell, and we could talk all day today with Gina Monday. How are you doing? Awesome. How are you doing? (laughs) I'm very excited to be chatting with you. I want you to jump right in and tell us about your journey into becoming a parent. Oh, sure. Uh, April 4th, 2004, my first daughter was born. I know my first daughter's 20 20 years old. So um, I'll tell you, I am an attorney. So I had just started in my profession. And so as a new attorney, you work all the time. And so um, luckily I had great in-laws and they actually helped me out a lot with her. Um, Probably the first five years, I probably could, you know, just spend as much time as I could. Um, I remember having her like sleep in my bed, you know, if if I wasn't working, she was always like by me. Um, And then... and then I had two more, uh, 2008, I had another girl. So my first one was Abigail, Eliana, and then I got Liam. He is nine. He's 2014. Um, but obviously as I progressed into my profession, I was able then to, you know, pull back a little bit, you know, I put my time in and then, um, finally when Liam was born, I was able to go part-time and then kind of be more of the mom I wanted to be. Mm. Um, so Yeah. Um, but no, it's, it's always been a juggle with me with where it's work, family, work, family, work, family. It always has been. And then even though I went part-time, um, as we'll talk about later in the podcast, I decided to write a book, which was, you know, talk about taking the fam time away from the family again. Um, but yeah, no, just, I think given, and we're going to stuff we'll talk about given what I've seen, um, as an attorney, you know, I've always treasured my family, my kids, um, having healthy kids has always just been, you know, such a a blessing that I've been really able to appreciate because of what I've done for the past 21 years. So it's, it's been a good journey. I'm really excited to learn because you became an attorney before having kids, but like you said, knew you were doing your time. Were you instantly involved in being an attorney working in childbirth yes right out of law school and listen they don't they don't teach you this stuff in law school they don't teach you this stuff and i never even knew there were childbirth attorneys until i started looking for my first job having a baby was on my radar i'd also gotten married i'd just gotten married so once i was i was hired into a team of over 20 of us and this is all we did were these childbirth cases where obviously something went wrong and baby's not born healthy baby's past and mom's past. So I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. I don't want it to happen during the birth of my baby. So I stuck with it. And yeah, 21 years later, here I am still doing it. I didn't know, like I'm learning that there are attorneys specifically for childbirth. So I think that's really important to point out that many of us even working in birth work might not realize that. Um, But that's fascinating that you got into it and that it was so exciting right out of the gate before having kids. That makes me so happy. That's, that's awesome. So you were learning about advocating for women before ever having gone through it. What did that teach you about what to look for and not look for in your own pregnancies and deliveries? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, my doctor was very low risk, meaning they were very cautious with me because of what I've, you know, of my job, first of all, and then, you know, what I've, what I've seen. So here's the deal. Like back in 2004, I mean, I, I just see, I, I know you've had 18, you have, you, well, I don't know if you birthed them, I didn't birth them all, but you have a bunch of kids. But yeah. So baby lawyers have a really hard time relaxing because of what we do see and deal with. So, you know, pretty much my friends and I, you know, we were all kind of pregnant around the same time and we all wanted C sections. Um, just elective 39 weeks C-sections, 2004, not acceptable. So my one friend was like, well, I'm just going to tell my doctor I have herpes because if you had herpes in 2004, you got your elective C-section. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not telling my doctor I have herpes. So my doctor's like, Gina, you got this, you can do it. And then basically, um, once I, so I did not get my, my scheduled elective C-section. I woke up in pretty good labor, pretty hardcore labor. 
And, you know, again, first job, you know, turning out what, two years, I mean, I was exhausted. Uh, so I must have slept through the easy contractions, but I woke up pretty hardcore. I go to the hospital and, you know, basically I'm like, turn the baby's heart rate towards me. So I'm just staring at the baby's heart rate. I know it's, you know, that's what we do, right? Because even when you're, you know, the first thing they learned, I learned as a childbirth attorney was how to read the baby's heart rate. They're like, this is how you know how the baby's doing during labor. And so wow. I like, just turned the baby. So I would just stare at it. And then, you know, something would blip and, and then they, and then it made the delivery team nervous. And then eventually they just suctioned me. Oh. They were like, this is that nobody could handle it. I could, you know, it was like a disaster. Um, but soon after that elective C-sections became more acceptable. And I'll tell you the baby lawyers, you know, over the many, many, many years, I, I don't know any of them that delivered vaginally. Which is crazy to me because I, mm -hmm. as a doula, will pretty much want to help you do anything to avoid the C-section. Like, so I, I love, oh, on the I, opposite. I love that. I, you know right. what? I wish I would have had a doula. Here's, here, here's the best thing about birthing doulas. Birthing doulas are not in childbirth cases. So, oh, I want to hear this. Okay. Yes. This, this is so, I am the biggest advocate for birthing doulas that you will ever, ever meet. Because in 21 years, I have never had a doula in a case. Listen, if a doula even talked to mom during her pregnancy, the doula would be a fact witness in my case. If doula stepped a foot in that delivery room, just for a minute, the doula would be a fact witness in my case. We've never had me or my colleagues, we've never had a doula in our case. Cases. Why? Wow. Because doulas are helping parents avoid these mistakes and complications you know, that we see, you know, doulas are amazing. And I, again, if I, I'm sure I would have delivered vaginally if I would have had a doula back in 2004. So, wow. Um, that's some pretty powerful and incredible information. I know as doulas, I'm big on get liability insurance. The, the rate of being sued is really low for doulas, but if it happens, you want to make sure that it's covered. So I, I love hearing that. Tell me, how did things change over time? Because you had these three babies. Were they all C-sections? Was the stress the same or worse with them? Because you're progressively, like over time, going through more and more and more childbirth attorney cases as you're growing your family. So where were you, how did you feel in all of that? Where were you at in all of that? Oh, I was a mess. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I need to, I'm not going to sugarcoat that. Yeah. I mean, I only see, you know, I'm not a healthcare, you know, you're lucky. You, you see the good, maybe yeah. some of the bad. I see the bad, only the bad. I'm not a medical person. I'm not a medical doctor. I'm just the attorney. So I only get to see yeah. the bad. Now I have had obviously friends and family who have contacted me over the years. So there is some good um, that has come out of it. Uh, no, it was, it was, it, my pregnancies were hard. Um, usually they just put, they just would take me off work um, towards the last couple months because they were like, you're just your best. Um, and I would just, you know, enjoy being pregnant and then, um, and whatnot, but I'll tell you. Um, so I had the elective C-sections at 39 yeah. weeks with the last two. Okay. And I'll tell you the craziest part is the mental psyche between going into labor so your body's natural okay. cues of get the baby out, get the baby out because you're in a bunch of pain. The only way the pain's going to stop is the baby comes out. So you, your body is just amazing, an amazing machine that really works, you know, to get baby out. So elective C-section at 39 weeks, you know, you wake up, all right, can't eat anything. So you just, you get dressed, you stroll, you go sit in the waiting room. You just, I just kept looking at my belly and I'm like, okay. You fill out the paperwork. Yeah. I'm like, this is great. Oh. Oh. Um, <laughs> yeah. But uh, no, I to tell you that mental psyche is something I don't think that people, I, I lucky, I'm lucky enough to understand the difference, but I mean, it is, it is still tough having an elective C-section because yeah. you don't have, your body's not giving you those cues and get the baby out, get the baby out. So the pain stops and uh, yeah. So it mentally it's, it's tough. It's nerve wracking Especially, again, given what I know, but I will say you, the reason that we do elective C-sections at 39 weeks or baby lawyers like to is because, um, because in our world, those mm -hmm. are the least, least risk to baby. Mm. That's why. Interesting. I, I'm 
we have a program here in one of our hospitals that where doulas are badged and I can be in the OR with my families that need to have a C-section. Mm. And I wish no woman had to go through that. I think the healing is really so much harder. Um, however, I'll stay in the OR all day. I love being in there. I love watching the C-sections. I love making a difference in that space where you usually feel very, very, very alone. And there are several mm-hmm. women that have um, hired me because they're going to be a planned C-section. Like it's a, they've already had one or they need one or there's a high risk. And, you know, in those situations, there's nothing wrong. It's way harder to heal from. It's not like you took the easy way out. It's the hard way out as far as I'm concerned. So yeah, I love being in that space. But the mental part, you are correct. Like these women who labor for a long time and end up going in are very different from women who show up planning it. The, it's completely different, completely yeah. different. Actually, I found it so fascinating. I wrote, I wrote a section in my book about it. The mental psyche of the C-section versus vaginal birth and spontaneous labor. I want to talk about your book. That was more recent. I I mean, we can kind of jump around as much as we want to here. But one, I'm super proud of you writing this book. And two, I know it's made a significant positive difference for doulas, for birth workers. So I don't know what the goal was when you wrote it, but I know that it's had probably peripheral effects on other people that maybe you didn't anticipate in the beginning. So I would love to hear more about that, like why you wrote it. And then you went part-time and wrote a book. <laughs> Welcome to time management. You know, I know, right. <laughs> I know it, was th- it took me thousands of hours and 14 months to write it, but no, I made the decision. We just had like a near, a, we had a really scary birth with my, uh, my niece was having the first baby of our ne- next generation. It was very scary. Um, something happened and it's, it's actually the introduction to the book. Okay. Um, but I, re- I realized at that point, I, I, because at that, I was 19 years deep into my profession that I did know a lot because there are reoccurring mistakes. There are reoccurring issues. So basically, I just made the decision that instead of getting involved in the aftermath of something going wrong, I would try to get involved before childbirth to help prevent these, you know, mistakes and complications that, you know, mm. I have just seen. And, you know, I'll tell you the doulas have, oh my goodness, go on my, I was saying, go on my Instagram, you'll see the doulas. I mean, they, they just really love and enjoy the book, but the other people who really love it are the labor and delivery nurses. Um, I oh, okay. even have one travel nurse and she brings my book to every hospital that she goes to um, because she likes the way I'm like even recommending like how to do a Pitocin induction because Pitocin is the okay. number one most common fact in a legal baby case. So most of my cases involve Pitocin, which is huge. So obviously I've analyzed that drug for 19 years. And so I wrote a chapter on how to have a safe Pitocin induction, which, you know, I think some doctors disagree with, some agree with it, some disagree. And that's another thing, you know, doctors across the board do not agree when it comes to um, childbirth. But, you know, I'll tell you the impact on my book actually came through a text last night, um, I I'm I was I've been crying since last night because it was really um hard to hear this but um I actually um started a podcast and I was able to in- interview a mom she gave birth four months ago her name's Bailey it's Bailey's story and Bailey walked in with a healthy baby and Bailey did not leave with a healthy baby and um so I heard her story and it, and it's everything I wrote about in my book because chapter 11, those are the common issues, the common, you know, mistakes that happen during childbirth. And basically her labor and delivery was chapter 11. And, um, but we did the podcast or whatnot and she texted me yesterday and she's like, I read your book. And she was like, it was really hard. Um, Bailey's also a nurse. Um, so she, yes, she is a medically trained, she's younger, she's medically trained. Um, but she did not know about labor and delivery. She didn't train in that part. She did like a rotation, but you know, basically walked in that day and just trusted her delivery team to deliver her baby healthy. And, and they didn't. And, but anyway, it was just, I knew chapter I, from talking to her, I knew chapter 11 would, you know, would would that that's what happened during her labor. And I wrote that chapter to help parents, you know, give them that heightened sense of awareness, activate their intuition. So that things like this occur, they, they just know to be on it. Um, But anyway, so she texted me just last night, just telling me, you know, it was, it was easy for her to read because she wanted to read it and she understood it very well. 
because it happened to her, but just the, it, it's very, very, it was very difficult for her to read um, because, you know, this is what she went through. And she's like, I would do anything for, you know, a healthy baby. And, um, but, you know, it's hard because my book came out in June, 2023, um, eight, well, oh my goodness, a year, almost ago. a year. Are we, are we in June almost? Oh my almost. goodness. Where are we? We're May, it's my son's birthday. It's May 25th, almost yes. it's May 24th. So almost a year my, ago. My book came out a year ago. Her baby was born four months ago. And, yeah. you know, it's just like, she just, I know, she just, I know she wishes she had the information. So then she said she had some, one of her um, best friends was pregnant and another one. So she was giving them my book, you know, again, to make sure it doesn't happen to them. But just, it was hard because it, that's how it played out. And she did not, she just didn't know. And she trusted her team. And uh, yeah, it's in the amount of, sadness that we talked about this um uh, in the podcast but just the amount of guilt and, and yeah. anger that she has you know she just trusted mm -hmm. this team she's younger it was her first time mom she just trusts she was a nurse she was a good nurse that's why she trusted them and they they had, i don't know like all the details but you know it, it's really hard um it's really hard i know i know you know watching the impact that my book had on her and her text message meant a lot last night like all right, I know this is going to, if we can get out there and other moms can see, like, it'll make a difference. Oh, and that's the biggest thing. It's something that we talked about when we first got on. Like, it, women think, women just trust the system, the whatever, right? They trust their healthcare providers. They trust the hospital. And um, I think in an emergency situation, that's not a bad thing. But for everything else, maybe not the best thing. When I work with nurses in the hospital, and I'm I'm in the hospital a lot, I always like to know about them and if they've had kids. And I'm not saying that you have to have given birth to a child to be a good labor and delivery nurse or a good doula. Obviously, a male OBGYN is never going to give birth, right? I do think it gives you a different perspective on, like we were talking, until you go through it, you you haven't gone through it, um, mm -hmm. even, in, even in the, even the nurses. So, yeah, that's kind of a battle of having them get the information about your book and read it ahead of time so that they can be advocates for themselves and yes. giving them a voice and giving them, I mean, you know, the hospital talks about informed consent. You sign a paper saying that you have informed consent. That doesn't mean that you understand the information. Informed is a very loose term in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And that's a problem because you saying, I think you should do this is not informing me about it. It's not educating me. It's not making sure I understand. And most doulas have a traumatic first experience and that's why they want to help other people so that other women don't have traumatic yes. experience, right? So why, why can't we reverse that so that we're not having those traumatic experiences? Can you divulge what is one of the biggest issues or the top couple issues in childbirth cases? Yeah. So definitely like we just like Pitocin number Pitocin. one. Mm -hmm. And then we talked about that. Now, listen, you know, I, my book is also problem solving. So, okay. And I did also, I started writing it too, for this information down for my kids also, because I'll tell you mm -hmm. how I would prepare them as an attorney doing childbirth cases. It's completely different than how a traditional family would prepare. So with my kids, you have to solve everything. So, you know, again, Pitocin number one, Okay, chapter 14, how to have a safe Pitocin induction. Um, next, um, if there's a complication or there's a mistake that occurs during labor and delivery, it is almost always after mom's water breaks. If the doctor wants to break your water, it's very important decision. And it's very important to ask the doctor, do you want to break my water because you want to be home for dinner or is there a medical reason? If there's a medical reason, what's, you know, what is that medical reason? Um, and, you know, going from there, that's, that's just a huge, huge decision that I don't think people realize. And especially, and you know what, during a Pitocin induction, that might be, you know, a good option because that may mean less Pitocin if they break your water. So sometimes there is a good reason, but it's important to find out or, but yeah. you know, if you're spontaneous, natural vaginal birth, you know, and they want to break your water, why? That's what I want to know. Why? Um, and again, there might be baby somewhat, something might be up with baby's heart rate and they want to place an internal monitor, which means they got to break your bag of water. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, but it's important to find out why. Um, yeah. I'll tell you another really important one is um, a busy labor and delivery unit. 
So that's, dude, you can get a great team, but if they're, you know, they're running hard, they're running thin. Um, it's, it's hard to, um, um, it's hard for them to, you know, focus. It's like sometimes labor and delivery team will triage people. Yeah. You know this, you yes, know, yes. so if you have a mom or a baby who's struggling in labor, then, you know, they're going to get the attention. You have a mom maybe who was stalled out, baby's fine, but you have a mom over here who's in trouble. They're going to almost triage, especially when the unit's busy. But, you know, they have to know that, you know, mom or baby may need, you know, may need something. Um, so it's important that there's certain steps that you take. So you are kind of more working with your delivery team. Um, you know, I suggest this is where I love having a doula, right? And this is, this makes so much sense. I mean, think about it. You get a busy labor and delivery unit. You have a doula who can be there with you. Um, doulas also, I don't think people realize sometimes with a delivery team, those are people who are scheduled to work that day. So mm -hmm. if you have a doula, you have somebody that you have formed this relationship with. Not only that, like a good doula like yourself, you're going to speak the language of the delivery team. So, or you're going to know when they need to be contacted or, you know, something like that. Um, and then right. I write, you know, in the book, you know, like even just designating, you know, husband, grandma, aunt, you know, somebody have that second set of eyes on you. If the unit does get busy, because as mom, mom needs to focus mentally and physically on delivering, you know, baby. Um, so it's, you know, it's important, um, to, you know, have that, be able to nod at your husband and be like, or, you know, go, yeah. go get my nurse or something's yeah. wrong. I'm in a bunch of pain or, or whatever it may be. Um, but yeah, those are definitely, um, you know, top three. Okay. I will, I'm going to pimp out your book everywhere because it's amazing. And I work in the birth work world. What tips of advice do you have or what, how would you do things differently? I don't know what question we want to use to kind of wrap things up, but what would you have done differently? Um, I know you wrote the book for your kids. So what advice would you give them or someone else so that they could go in having other than hiring a doula, obviously. And I know your son is getting ready to have a birthday party. So he's no, I know kidding. I'm like, I think my kids, I'm like, there's like people at the door and they're just staring at them. I'm not sure what's going on. They're all looking at me and I'm like, hi, I'm like, get the door. Get the so door. I apologize. Hopefully we're just wrapping is, up. So this you is going to be party. raw or you can cut it, whatever you want to do. It's, but yes, it's gonna I know. Be raw. I'm, yeah, yeah. So perfect. Great. You're perfect. Gonna see. <laughs> this so, is real listen. life. This is very real life. <laughs> So let's so, end on like a happy note of how to give someone encouragement. One, you're there as an advocate. Two, that you have the book. Yeah. Um, is there anything, so, a piece of advice? Oh, 100%. Listen, there are so many things that can also be learned from the baby cases. And that's chapter one of my book. So chapter, the recurring issues, that was more chapter 11. But mm -hmm. chapter one is what we can learn, whether it's the families, the medical people, um, the experts. And so as a lesson, obviously we learned from it, from what happened in the past to prevent it from happening in the future. So it goes through the 13 lessons and lesson number one, listen, get ready, prepare for childbirth. But then it has so many other different great lessons on knowing your delivery team, picking your doctor, mm. the baby's heart rate, baby's heart rate is so important and whatnot. So I, uh, ending on a good note, chapter one is on my website for free. Yep. Um, because that is so incredible. I know that if parents at least have this information, it will definitely, you know, it will definitely put them and point them in the right direction. And then as you'll see in chapter one, each chapter is then, I'm sorry, each lesson is a subsequent chapter. Um, Got it. But just having, if you just go on my website and you download it for free, um, I don't even make you give me my email or your email and everyone's like, Gina, grab their email. I'm like, oh, maybe one day I don't, what am I going to do with their email? You know, of course I'm the, I'm the savvy business person, right? Uh, no, I'm actually just really want parents to have a healthy baby. And mm -hmm. I just know if everyone knows these lessons, um, it'll definitely point them in the right direction. Thank you, Gina. Thank you for being on and thank you for sharing and thank you for the work that you do, especially. I am so abundantly proud of you and what you're doing. So thank you so much.
Uh, Jennifer, thank you for having me. I it was so awesome learning all about you and how amazing <laughs> you are. So I am just so honored and privileged just to be here on your podcast. So thank Thanks. you for having me.